Well, good afternoon. I'm Chris Fanton. It's my pleasure to welcome you to Asthma Grand Rounds uh, for what is the start of, I think, our 22nd season of Asthma Grand Rounds. And I also will welcome those uh, joining by live webcasting today. We have a new system that we're using, and uh, I'd like to invite you to submit questions if you'd like. The way we're going to do it is uh, by having you text them to this number. Better write it down, 617-513-6043, and then we'll submit the questions to our speaker at the end of her presentation. So it is a special pleasure for me to introduce uh, Dr. Mariana Castells uh, to you. Uh, sorry, Dr. Uh, Castells is a member of the uh, Division of Rheumatology, Immunology, and Allergy here at the Brigham and Women's Hospital. I think many of you may have gotten to know her uh, as the resource for treating patients with hypogamma globulinemia and immune deficiency, or maybe it was in her role as a leader in creating and implementing a program for drug desensitization at the Brigham and Women's Hospital and Dana-Farber Cancer Institute. But she comes to us today wearing her hat as director of the mastocytosis Center here at the Brigham and Women's Hospital and Dana-Farber Cancer Institute. She's also a member of the advisory board of the National uh, Mastocytosis Society and uh, very appropriately full professor of medicine at Harvard Medical School. So we're pleased to have as our speaker today on mastocytosis, Dr. Mariana Castells. Thank you very much, Chris, and congratulations to the Partners Asthma Center. You have been a driving force, and uh, we have all enjoyed and, and taking you know, uh, a great benefit from it. So congratulations to you and to everybody there. Uh, so it's my great pleasure to wear my third or fourth hat, but this is my favorite hat. I've studied mast cells for probably now, I, I, I would be ashamed to say 30 years, but maybe it's that long. And, uh, and then today, we'd like to have a conversation about, you know, this fascinating world of mastocytosis and related muscle activation disorders. And the reason I say fascinating, it's because you probably will have in your life, even if you don't do allergy or hematology or immunology, will have those quote-unquote crazy patients who will come to your, schedule, to your clinic and say, doctor, I have this mast cell activation disorder. So today what I'd like to do is I'd like to just put that in the map and then, and then share with you what kind of the new thinks about it. So I wanted to tell you a little bit of a pearl, and this is more for fellows and for people. Not all elevated tryptases are mastocytosis. We are going to see that. Uh, the new familial tryptosemia that was published in uh, Nature Genetics by Dr. Mel and his group at the NIH of uh, three or four alpha genes, then 10 to 15% of mastocytosis present with low tryptase. So your high index of suspicion when you see a patient with symptoms of muscle activation. And then one, the most interesting thing is when we deal with mast cell, really mastocytosis patients, the ones who have low mast cell burden are associated with the most severe symptoms of mast cell activation. And this is something for the future. We don't know why. We don't know if uh, other receptors, mast cell receptors in the surface of those patients with low mast cell burden are uh, highly expressed, and that's the reason. So let's go to here, and this is like a boring slide, but I just need to tell you about this slide. Uh, the classification and if you want to take one slide, this is the one of uh, mast cell activation disorders now lies into primary mast cell activation disorders, which is the mastocytosis. We're going to talk about that. And then the monoclonal mast cell activation syndrome. We're going to see a vignette in a second. Then secondary mast cell activation disorders, which are disorders that are al al associated with other diseases, hypothyroidism, allergy, connective tissue disorders, in which the patients seem to have mast cells that are tweakier, and then they release uh, mediators. And then the one that I was talking to you about is the idiopathic mast cell activation syndrome. So this is the one that you probably will hear more about, uh, which is kind of the new kid on the block. And um, here are some of the vignettes. So we have a B here, and then we have a very nice mast cell here on top of a blood vessel, and the B is going to attack that mast cell. How is going to attack that mast cell could be through uh, an IgE that is sitting on the IgE receptors of the mast cells or through phospholipase A2 or some other of the components of the venom. So I'm going to play to you one of the clinical cases. So this is a 70... Uh, 
47, excuse me, 47 year old male with loss of consciousness minutes after being stung with a yellow jacket in the backyard. Uh, he's resuscitated with epinephrine and then he has on evaluation specific IgEs to yellow jacket and honeybee and he started on allergy shots. So that works well. And then he starts not to do well. He has reactions on buildup and he requires a lot of epinephrine. And then somebody says, what about getting triptase when he has one of such episodes? Yes. Is it better now? Is it, okay, perfect. Um, and then his, uh, his triptase is elevated. And uh, when uh, this returns to baseline, it's still 25. He doesn't have any of the typical lesions of mastocytosis in the skin, uh, but, but the level of suspicion is pretty high for potential mastocytosis. So bone marrow is done. And here we have what it, you see here. Very nice aggregates that stain with tryptase or kid, and the patient is labeled as mastocytosis. And we give the patient omalizumab and immediately is able to tolerate, and he's stung in the field, and nothing else happens. So, this is a patient who, when I was a fellow with Dr. Sheffer, this patient, the first time I saw somebody like that was somebody who came to see us who had had actually a stroke during one of the immunotherapy sessions that received an, uh, an injection and had a severe hypotensive event and stroked. And at that time, about almost 25 years ago, we said, you know, what about that triptase? And the triptase was 32. It ended up that the patient had mastocytosis. So this presentation was new to us. This is another presentation. This is the Boston Marathon. This is one of our patients who is sore after that, you know, who wouldn't. Uh, this is my thing in, the bu in my bucket. I should be able to run a marathon one of those days, but it's not happening tomorrow. Um, ibuprofen, you know, this guy gets ibuprofen and what happens? So he's 33 and he has pretty bad joint and sore pain and he, um, has uh, his ibuprofen, and then he becomes really short of breath. He's hypotensive, and uh, he passes out. He needs intubation. They call us from the MGH, and they say, oh, he has triptase is 2,000. What should we do? What should we do with this patient? Well, uh, first of all, we should listen to the patient. We should do a good history. So he has had symptoms of uh, flushing, chronic fatigue, depression, bone pain for a very long time. And one undress, which uh, nobody has ever undressed, he has few lesions that I'll show you in a second in his chest. And my next thing was just marrow the, the patient. And we marrow the patient, and here are the aggregates. He also had a positive kid mutation, and his baseline trip days was 32. So somebody who just was running the Boston Marathon, mastocytosis. So this is pollen, pollen season. So we have the pollen grains. Here's our friends, you know, ragweed. And uh, for the ones of you who have patients with, uh, uh, with a ragweed pollen allergy, uh, immunotherapy, or sublingual tablets, that's kind of the new key down the block. So those things can be uh, happening. So could a patient with uh, ragweed allergy be a case of mastocytosis? Well, here it is. 44-year-old female, she has seasonal allergies and she has ragweed allergy and started on immunotherapy. And then she starts not to do well again. This is like the telltale sign. She has chest pressure, she's lightheaded. One day her doctor says, you know, I'm gonna give you epi and you're out of this, this clinic. I don't wanna see you again because this is not gonna go well. And okay, no more immunotherapy, but she continues to have symptoms, abdominal pain, nausea, vomiting. Those are unrelated to anything. And she goes to the emergency room and she's hypotensive and she receives epinephrine. The triptase is 8.75, no elevation. But uh, somebody like me said, you know, I think we have to think this a little bit further. Uh, let's do a kid mutation in peripheral blood. It's positive. Her Ig is negative for specific foods and her bone marrow doesn't have aggregates but has what we call spindle-shaped mast cells that stain with CD25. So she has a clonal mast cell disorder because she has positive kid mutation, CD25 expression, and spindle-shaped mast cells. As I mentioned to you, clonal mast cell disorders can come in those two versions. So let me talk for a couple of minutes about my good friend's uh, mast cells. So, so when I, in, 1990, uh, in 1987, I was doing my PhD with Larry Schwartz. We're so happy we had two mast cells, you know, mast cells that were mast cells, what we call TC, and then mast cells, I think there's uh, mast cells that were uh, TC here, tryptase, chymase, and then also mast cells that were uh, chymase, um, 
for triptase alone, and then chymase, this is the third, three mast cells. So depending on where the mast cells were, you can have mast cells that are in the skin, and then they have triptase chymase, and then the mast cells that were in the lung, in the alveoli, only triptase, or some mucosa. So there's a heterogeneity of mast cells. But what is mesmerizing is this, which is published by Nora Barrett and Diane Dwyer and Frank Austin, which is that depending on where you look in the different tissues, you have a different density of mast cells. They look completely different. This is comparing to a basophil. And the transcriptosome here, you see that all the red, all those genes and proteins that are very completely different than basophils, than NK cells, than any other cell. So mast cells are really unique on its own, and they are here, and they don't really relate too much with basophils or eosinophils than we thought before. So really, mast cells are extremely um, unique cells, and uh, they are the bad guys sometimes. So the bad guys, here is uh, uh, the publication by also the group of uh, Dr. Boyce and, and, uh, and Elliot Israel and everybody uh, in the Josh Boyce lab with uh, Catherine Cahill here, uh, that uh, they use a uh, inhibition of KIT, uh, imatinib, to treat patients with severe refractory asthma. And you see here that uh, you know, there is a, a, a change that is significant in the methacholine, but also that decrease the triptase level. So it, is it like the mast cells are the only bad guys in asthma? Probably not, but uh, they have you know, a, a role that is very, very important. So here is the, uh, Elliot, you just missed your slide. <laughs> I'll put it back. <laughs> the bad guys here. <laughs> well, and we have some things to work with. Um, so mast cells do have, you know, all those receptors, and the latest one, as, as we were mentioning, is those when the G-coupled proteins, and this was already published uh, earlier, uh, with a significant receptor that is associated with reactions to drugs, uh, such as uh, um, anesthetics, atracuronium, ciprofloxacin. But then there is a bunch of other receptors, and then there is those uh, mediators. So when we deal with mediators, we have you know, our friend tryptase, but many other mediators are here, including histamine and, and the proteoglycans. We have cytokines, we have lipid mediators. The reason I'm showing you this is if you have a patient who has lots of mast cells, lots of those things could be potentially happening. And so here, what we show is uh, uh, what we had published uh, a while ago, uh, which is that we try to relate the mast cell mediators with their actions and their symptoms. So if we think that histamine and prostaglandin D2 are associated with vasodilation, with uh, um, hypotension, uh, with itching, with all those things, you can actually see the list of the mediators here and then the potential the potential effects. So as Dr. Austin used to teach me when I was a fellow, uh, this is all a, a pure speculative po uh, you know, co correlation. If a patient itches, we think, oh, okay, this might be histamine, but could there be something else? Could there be PAF or, or, or substance B or something? So we have this that we think in terms of patients who have mastocytosis uh, that are here. So if we think about patients releasing histamine, they can be itchy, they can have uh, increased vasopermeability, uh, heparin, they could be anticoagulation. And then here with the proteases, the uh, physiological actions are less well known. Uh, and with cystinal leukotrienes, you know, you, you can see that. But for example, we have one of the mediators, like prostaglandin D2, it's associated with the mixed organic brain syndrome. And that's really important. If you measure in patients who have mastocytosis, elevated prostaglandin levels, or in patients with muscle activation syndromes, they can have thousands of levels of this prostaglandin, and that's highly associated with brain fog and any other symptom that they can tell us. So they are not, they are not really cuckoo, those patients. And I'm sorry to use that word, but a lot of people have come to us saying, you know, I can't really concentrate. I can't really read. I go out of my home, and when I turn the corner, I don't know where I'm going, and I'm driving. And you measure the prostaglandin level in the urine, 11,000. The normal range is 1,000 to 5,000. So those patients truly, truly have their, their brain embedded in prostaglandins. Uh, other mediators here, TNF-alpha, well, a lot of our patients with mastocytosis say, I can't get out of bed. I have to, eat, to sleep 18 hours, 20 hours. They, they have tremendous amount of those cytokines. Um, so... One of the things that uh, I also uh, was very interested in is the physiological function of tryptase. 
And physiological function of tryptase, Rick Stephen and uh, one of my uh, PhD students, uh, Alicia Prado Garcia, uh, found that, and we published in 2012, that the fibrinogen uh, alpha chain can be broken by the uh, tryptase, uh, beta tryptase. And that work is, is really highly important. During anaphylaxis, when there's a massive release of tryptase from NAS cells, um, we, uh, the, the breaking of this chain could be a significant marker for anaphylaxis, but also it prevents, and this is a mouse work that has um, MMCP6 is the uh, counterpart of uh, beta tryptase, and here you see that there's a blood vessel that doesn't have any deposits of fibrin, but uh, thrombosis can occur when uh, there is a missing uh, the tryptase. So there is this physiological role for tryptase is possibly a good role, and in that case, mast cells would be protective of thrombosis. So whether that can be extended to other diseases, uh, we haven't done that yet. So when we talk about primary uh, clonal mast cell disorders, we talk about cutaneous mastocytosis, about systemic mastocytosis, which is further divided in indolent, in associated with other hematological disorders, in aggressive mastocytosis, and mast cell leukemia, mast cell sarcoma, and, and extracutaneous mastocytoma. So this is kind of the classical classification. The diagnosis relies on the major presentation of these aggregates. So everybody who sees this bone marrow will be able to say, okay, we have 15 mast cells together. That is uh, the aggregates that are required, 15 more mast cells. But then the minor uh, criteria are not well known. So the expression of CD25, uh, the CD2 is less expressed, but CD25 is also significant of a clonal disorder. The uh, uh, mutation, we will talk about the mutation in a second, and then the uh, baseline trip days of 20 as well as the presence of uh, the morphology uh, of uh, spindle tree mast cells. Now, there are other and uh, novel presentations for mastocytosis, like what one is called well-differentiated mastocytosis, which was published just very recently for the group uh, in uh, Spain of uh, Dr. Escribano and Alvarez Tose. Uh, those mast cells are very round. They are not spindle-shaped, but they're a very high burden of those. And then the systemic mastocytosis that I presented to you without cutaneous involvement and with very low mast cell burden, but hymenoptera and aphylaxis. And those patients, actually, there's quite a bit of of those patients that have been uh, reported uh, as dying of uh, hymenopterous stings in the field without nobody knowing that they had mastocytosis. So this is, this is really a new thing. So this is what I was talking about. Systemic mastocytosis, aggregates of mast cells, they're right here, you count 15, you're all set. What about this? So Jason Hornick, who is the pathologist at the Mastocytosis Center, has, and, and, uh, and Jim Aiken, who uh, now is in Michigan, and um, Matt Hamilton and I look at those uh, once a month, and we see spindle-shaped mast cells here. And those spindle shapes are totally abnormal. So the presence of spindle-shaped mast cells that all sustain for CD25 are two minor criteria that are associated with monoclonal mast cell activation disorder and uh, equ equals a clonal mast cell disorder. So, so those, those two are part of the clonal mast cell disorders. And something that is totally new uh, is that the, this we published in 2014, but patients who said, I don't want to have a bone marrow biopsy, we can look at their intestine. Those patients do have intestinal symptoms, dramatic intestinal symptoms like bloating, abdominal pain, nausea, vomiting, diarrhea. Those patients may actually have their intestines studied with mast cells, and you see here the stain with kid, but also the associated expression of CD25 and tryptase. So those patients, we actually can come with an endoscope do a biopsy, and we have a diagnosis here because the, bi the bone marrow biopsy is not necessary. We just find a tissue that expresses enough mast cells. And the mutations, so the mutations in KID are important, and the most important mutations are uh, situated in exon 17. So the D8116V uh, is present in over 90% of the patients with mastocytosis. But other mutations have actually been seen that are also associated with mastocytosis, and other tumors, like the GIST tumors, are associated with also uh, mutations in this uh, oncogene. So uh, tyrosine kinase inhibitors, such as imatinib, that can treat like GIST, 
actually cannot treat mastocytosis because the site of action is right situated here and uh, with the mutation cannot bind here. But other tyrosine kinase inhibitors that do not have this primary site of action can actually treat mastocytosis. So this is one thing that we are looking in the future to treat the proliferation of mast cells with tyrosine kinase inhibitors. Why is the kid mutation so important? So you have here that this is a um, kid mutation uh, present in indolent systemic mastocytosis. So here, the flow cytometry with different colors. We have mast cells here that are uh, differentiated from neutrophils and from all the other cells. And it's one patient here, one patient there. And so the group in Spain was able actually to look at the different populations and do the kid mutation in each one of the populations. And in this here, the, the, the kid mutation is only present in the mass cell population. And this here, the kid mutation is present in all the other lineages, in neutrophils, in lymphocytes, in monocytes, and in eosinophils. And in that regard, what happens is this. For patients who have restricted expression of the mutation, the lifelong uh, prognosis is as a normal person. There will be no uh, difference, and there is no restrictions in life expectancy. But in patients who express multi-lineage mutation uh, have very short spans. And so that is something that we need to resolve. Nowadays, we don't have, this is only for research, we don't have the way in which when we diagnose a patient with indolent systemic mastocytosis, what's my prognosis, doctor? I said, okay, you know, we can't do exactly a very accurate prognosis right now. We'll follow tryptases over the next two to three years, and we will look at your mutation, and, and we will be able to see in which direction we're moving. In the future, I would like to have this possible so that we can actually accurately say, you know, your mutation is in more than the mast cell lineage. Uh, we will have to use chemotherapy in maybe one, two, three years when the hematological disease is going to overtly uh, be pre present. And the CD25 expression is here. Uh, you have here that cells that uh, are mast cells should not be expressing CD25. And this was seminal work uh, done by Dr. Escobano and his group. And they saw that the expression of CD25 was associated with clonal mast cells and the kid mutation. And some of the, those are uh, CD, CD2 also positive. The tryptase levels is the one thing that I was telling you. So this is a, one of my favorite papers, but I was working with Larry Schwartz in uh, 87 and we published that in the New England. And so patients with systemic mastocytosis have a width of elevated uh, tryptases, uh, and that's at baseline. So they can have from here to here. They can be expressing 1,000. Those would be the more aggressive mastocytosis. But as I mentioned at the beginning, some of those patients, we have normal tryptases. So that normal tryptase will not indicate that the patient may not have mastocytosis. And then with, mass, with anaphylaxis, here is what happens with um, the uh, elevations. So elevated tryptase levels, mastocytosis, yes. Chronic kidney disease, that can also be associated. Chronic idiopathic urticaria, myeloid neoplasis. And then more interestingly, idiopathic familial tryptosemia. So this is something new that was published uh, last year in uh, Nature Genetics. So there are patients even in the general population. Uh, so one, one thing that I should mention is that when do you call it elevated? Elevated 11.5 uh, is the level of tryptase, the normal range, median 5. But uh, we need to know the baseline. We need to know what is the baseline because Patients and 27% of patients, Caucasian patients, are missing one of the uh, alpha genes uh, for tryptase, can have lower levels. But if somebody baseline is four and during an episode is more than 6.8, that patient had a significant elevation of tryptase and a significant mast cell activation. So we really need to know what the baseline is. Familial tryptosemia is associated uh, with the presentation of patients who have uh, uh, L. Dallas like syndromes and uh, some POTS like syndrome. And I just want to show you something that's really novel. So, those patients, in patients uh, in the general population, we have alpha and beta genes here uh, alpha, beta, or beta, beta, alpha, alpha. But then, in patients with two alphas, or three alphas, or four alpha genes, there's an elevation, intrinsic elevation of tryptase. And that was discovered by the group of um, the NIH uh, in patients who say that they had some muscle activation um, looking like uh, mast mastocytosis, and they had the joint symptoms, they have pot-like symptoms, psychicardia. Their bone marrows were totally clean. 
but there is nothing in terms of muscle hyperplasia or aggregates of CD25 expression or spindle shape, but they do have elevated triptases. So what's the significance in terms of how do we call this? We call it familial uh, tryptosemia. Other mediators, we have uh, methylhistamine, which is associated also with muscle cytosis, and, and methylhistamine can be measured in 24-hour urine. And we have prostaglandins, which also can be measured in 24-hour urine and really makes the difference uh, in those patients. And then we have uh, pros uh, leukotrienes that uh, it's less accurately but also reflect a burden of the mast cell. So as we mentioned here, um, we need, in terms of the criteria for mastocytosis, we need those aggregates, so that would be one major, or we need, uh, and one minor here, elevated tryptase, or the spindle shape, or the CD25 expression, or the mutation, or we need three minor. So a patient who would have spindle shaped mast cells that express CD25 and has a mutation or an elevated tryptase would also have systemic mastocytosis. And so that's something that people have been missing a lot because those three minor criteria can be present in patients with mastocytosis. Why is mastocytosis important? Because it breaks bones. A lot of patients with mastocytosis are diagnosed when they break their hips, when they break their vertebrae. Uh, osteoporosis is the most common feature. IL-6 elevation is associated with more uh, bone fractures and osteoporosis. The risk of progression, as I mentioned to you, some like 20% of the patients with mastocytosis will actually progress to hematological disorders. They can have really pretty significant GI uh, ulcers or gastric discomfort. And then the anaphylaxis is important. So uh, I don't know if, hmm, uh, OK. So I think here we had a title. And I'm not real sure what the title is. But um, there was uh, allergy and mastocytosis is the title here. So what's not increased in mastocytosis is atopic disorders. They are not increased, and a drug allergy per se, Ig mediated, is not increased, or food allergies. But what is increased uh, in mastocytosis patients is venom, uh, Ig and non-Ig uh, um, anaphylaxis or hypersensitivity, anaphylaxis, and then uh, idiopathic venom exercise induced and drug induced. So that is associated with that. And uh, in uh, proliferative disorders, uh, 23 to 33%, and in our, uh, here in the mastocytosis center, 30% of the patients who present with mast cell activation disorders, and particularly clonal mast cell activation disorders, have anaphylaxis. So it's not an uncommon feature, one third of those patients. So it's very important to actually make sure that we understand that, and the patients, when they may present to us, they may not have had an anaphylactic event, they might. Uh, encounter a bee sting, they might uh, encounter a non steroidal anti inflammatory medication, they might go to surgery, they may do any of those things, and then they will have an aphylaxis. And again, Hymenoptera is the most common one. This is kind of the initial paper by the group of, in Italy of Bonadonna in 2009 of 379 patients, and all the patients with anaphylaxis in that group had a clonal mast cell disorder. So the serum tryptase should be checked in all the patients with anaphylactic reactions to Hymenoptera. And a bone marrow, actually, and, and I kind of even lowered the bar, a bone marrow is absolutely necessary when they have elevated tryptases, even below the 20 uh, criteria. Cutaneous mastocytosis, just so uh, for your uh, understanding. I have seen patients who have this, who are a little bit less than that. They have been told by their doctors that those are beauty grains and that uh, this is like aging spots. I remember a 23-year-old who came to me, she had already three uh, fractures, three vertebral fractures, and this kind of skin, and uh, she was told that this was aging spots at 23. So, you know, <laughs> I'm, I should be dead by now, so. <laughs> So cutaneous mastocytosis is really, really, really on, overlooked and underlooked all the time. Most of the time, the patients who come to the mastocytosis center, when we address them, we find those. So in 2016, we put together the new classification of cutaneous manifestation in patients with mastocytosis. And you see here that the progression can be from few dots here to this pretty impressive thing. But what's more important is this. We call now this, instead of early carapigmentosa, it's called macular papular, uh, and then we add cutaneous mastocytosis, of course, and we now add either monomorphic or polymorphic. 
And the reason we say that is the polymorphic presentation where the lesions are not all the same would be seen in children. They are larger. They're in the trunk and head extremities, but they disappear by, th by a mechanism that we still don't understand. The kit can actually have some mutations in those kids, but it seemed to be regulated by hormones by uh, testosterone, estrogen, progesterone, and although those kids can present some of the mutation, their the disease is temporary. And their uh, time, the, the frequency of anaphylaxis is very low. So if you deal with a kid who has never had an anaphylactic event with cutaneous mastocytosis, you may think twice about giving them an EpiPen. And I'm not against giving them an EpiPen, but if they never have, their pot potential for having an anaphylactic reaction is probably low, and it relates to the tryptase level. So with a normal tryptase, cutaneous mastocytosis may not be a risk for anaphylaxis. In adults, the risk for anaphylaxis is pretty high. So in any adult who has systemic mastocytosis or cutaneous mastocytosis, they have to carry an EpiPen. And again, your mutation is kit d 816 b that's the magic mutation, and you can actually have it in the peripheral buds. You can actually look for that. And in cutaneous mastocytosis, and this is a, a seminal work done by the French group uh, in 2009, they found that biopsies of children with cutaneous mastocytosis detected this mutation. And that mutation was kind of predictive that those kids were going to advance to uh, a systemic disease at a later age. So only about 15 to 20 percent of children will progress to have systemic diseases, but in those kids, it will be possible to determine that earlier than just waiting to see if they're going to lose their, their lesions. And the Darier sign is something very kind of easy to do, but nobody does it, actually. No one, when they come to us, so if, what is this lesion? Well, scratch it. And if you scratch it and it becomes really inflamed and it's red and it's itchy and the histamine is released and some prostaglandins are released and becomes vasodilated here, this is a pathognomonic sign of cutaneous mastocytosis. And now let's turn to, we have reviewed the primary mast cell activation disorders, mastocytosis, cutaneous or systemic. We have reviewed monoclonal mast cell activation disease in this lady who had ragweed allergy and she didn't have the aggregates. So kind of we are positioned now to understand what is required for this diagnosis. What is required for secondary mast cell activation syndrome is, is kind of ruling out this. So we do a tryptase, we do a kid mutation. In the worst case scenario, we do a bone marrow biopsy, nothing is there, and we can attribute the symptoms of mast cell activation to either connective tissue disorders, hypothyroidism, allergies, and other underlying disease. We have now this new disorder, uh, familial tryptosemia, and in those patients, we have elevated tryptases, and they have POTS-like symptoms, L or downloslide symptoms, and those patients are right in the middle here. We don't think that they, have, they don't have a clonal disorder. Now, the new kit on the blog, and I just want to spend you know, a few minutes, is this idiopathic mast cell activation syndrome. So the patients, now the doctor is Mr. Google. So I'm flushing. I have abdominal bloating pain. Sometimes I have diarrhea. I have a mast cell. And you do that, and I've done it, and it comes. Mastocytosis first thing that comes in Google. So those patients come to you and they say, I have mastocytosis, doctor. I had a, you know, quite a bit of patients says, you know about that? And I yeah. said, yeah, I, I know about that. I know about that. <laughs> so they just want me to make sure that I will confirm that they have the mast cell activation disorder. And unfortunately, you know, 90% of the time, they, we come back and assess, well, actually, you know, you don't have that. But I have a, a smart phrase that comes after that. You know, if you had that, it would be maybe in this category. So you may have a leukemia hematological disorder, so you better not have that. And half of them buy into that, and they say, oh, okay, I should be happy I don't have it. So not everybody's, you know, smart enough to figure out that, the, you know, they don't have any of, of this. But um, the, the people who would come would have, and this is the proposed criteria that we had, Recurrent symptoms consistent with mast cell activation in at least two organs. So flushing, itching, uh, uh, respiratory distress, uh, gastrointestinal symptoms, nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, reflux, kind of can be minimal. The second thing is they have to have a response to the treatment. And uh, we will ac actually look at that. We do antihistamines, we do chromalin, we do leukotriene blockers, we do aspirin to block. So all of that has to be at least 50% response. 
And then there should be biochemical evidence for mast cell activation. So either one of the mediators that I presented to you, either tryptase, methylhistamine, or prostaglandins, at some point in time in their life should be elevated. And then we have to rule out primary and secondary causes, just so, as I mentioned, because that can be associated with a nonspecific mast cell activation. So when we look at those patients uh, with the Matt Hamilton and um, Jason Hornick and Jim Aiken, we put this paper together here. We look at the patients, how they presented to us. And so they had abdominal pain, dermatographism, flushing, and, and all those symptoms here were pretty much the more significant was the gastrointestinal symptoms. They are females. So, so that's another thing to think about. So they are the same population that has rheumatoid arthritis, that has drug allergies, that has... So, so there is a component here that we think could be hormonal or could be any other component, but there are a majority of those patients are females. And I wanted to dwell a second in here. So we measure tryptase, we measure beta tryptase, which is released during activation. We measure methylhistamines and we measure prostaglandins. And so those patients seem to have either one of those mediators. They don't have all of them. So some patients, here you have a group who had elevated tryptases. Here you have a group who had elevated beta tryptases, like the activation. You have a group here who had uh, histamine. And we have a group here who had, and, and somewhere around here, that had uh, the prostaglandin. Some of them might, but this, the minority. So those patients seem to actually have a phenotypic uh, expression of the disease that may correlate with the different mediators that they release. And we have never actually thought about doing this study, but we want to segregate those patients. Do they manifest mainly with uh, gastrointestinal symptoms? So is this mediated mostly by prostaglandins, or uh, do they have more skin, uh, skin manifestation, flushing and itching, and, and this is more like histamine mediated? So, so it, it is interesting that, and we, ha we have been thinking about this population for a while. We haven't done the, the research yet. Interestingly, because they have a lot of gastrointestinal manifestation, we have looked at their gastrointestinal biopsies. So a lot of those patients with Matt Hamilton and Jason Horning, we have looked at them, and they have completely normal gastrointestinal mast cells. So the mast cells are round, they are not aggregated, they don't have spindle shape, they don't stain with CD25. And we have here the number of mast cells, and this is really good that we did this because we now say patients are referred to us, oh, doctor, I have like 50 mast cells per high power field in my duodenum. Well, it's normal. So that is based on the normality, based on uh, 100 patients that we looked at. And uh, the mast cells can actually be elevated in the colon, up to 30-something, and can be elevated in the stomach. So having mast cells that are in this range does not predispose those patients to have either mast cell activation syndrome or mastocytosis. The response to treatment, this is, again, from our paper. This is like complete response, major response, partial response. All of the patients who, who have mast cell activation syndrome uh, have to respond to the mediator blockade. So if they don't respond, it's unlikely that they have a mast cell activation syndrome. Again, uh, this is like the third criteria. So how do we treat mast cell disorders? So in general, principles are here. So we really want to try, initially, we want to try to avoid the triggers. And, and what are the triggers for mast cell activation? We don't understand them very well, but we have collected them through the years. So changes in temperature, heat, hymenopterous things, as we say, non steroidal anti-inflammatory medications, opiates, muscle relaxants, all of those uh, can actually potentially trigger the patients. And some foods, uh, alcohol is, I, I didn't uh, put it here, alcohol is a major trigger for mast cell activation in mast cell, in mastocytosis patients. So whether is, as I mentioned to you, because they have so many of those um, G-coupled protein receptors, we don't know. I am very interested in knowing if the patients who have mastocytosis express more of those receptors could be potentially triggered by, non-specifically by those, uh, either drugs or, or uh, uh, foods or a, in any other non-specific way. So that, that is something that we're looking. But the patients, this is very personal. You ask the patients, what are your foods that don't trigger you? You stick to them. Uh, if you're, if when you're exposed to the um, to the heat and you go to the beach, you trigger your mast cells become really inflamed. The, uh, have a cooling vest or take your antihistamines before you do that. So avoiding triggers is critical. 
exercise can be one of them, and, and that's you know something that we have to try to get the patients to continue to exercise, but uh, avoid you know at muscle activation. Epinephrine, epinephrine, epinephrine. They have to carry two epinephrines uh, uh, injectables. They have to know how to use them. They have to know what to do. Uh, uh, patients initially can be very scared of epinephrine. They can inject intramuscular. They have to be laying flat, not upright or sitting. So this is like a key piece of education for all the patients with muscle activation disorders. For patients with cutaneous mastocytosis, there is a 4% sodium chromaline cream that is really good at lowering the episodes, the acute episodes. Uh, there is for, for girls who you know, are uh, teenagers, want to go to the beach, and they want to not be told uh, if you have chicken pox all the time, PUVA, you can actually remove that, but it comes back within six months to a year, and then there's a little bit of a risk for um, uh, melanoma and other cancers. But then anti-mediated therapy really works well for those patients. For indolent and other mastocytosis, we have to block all the mediators. So, so far right now, what we're doing is we are using H1, H2. We have antilocotrine, we have chromaline, we have aspirin for blockade of uh, prostaglandin. So this is kind of the, all the armamentarium that we have. What has come to us really timely is omalizumab. So omalizumab is not an indication, so it's not indicated for patients with muscle activation or for patients with mastocytosis. But urticaria pigmentosa is a fancy name, so I changed that name for chronic idiopathic urticaria, and that's how we have been achieving this, which may not be totally legal. I'll, this is my disclaimer here. Um, so, uh, you know, it's what it is. But uh, Melody Carter did the initial st study at the NIH of patients with mastocytosis and cutaneous mastocytosis who had recurrent episodes of anaphylaxis. And she started that with 10 kids, uh, adolescents, and she put them on omalizumab. It worked like a charm. So I, we, we meet once a year. Um, this year I will be going to Paris with my colleagues to, to talk about this. And we, we started to use omalizumab with those patients. It reduced to almost zero the amount of muscle activation events in those patients. So we have actually been pushing for that. I don't think we're going to get an indication, but uh, at least if we were able to push the indication to an aphylaxis, that would definitely uh, be extremely helpful. Steroids are really helpful. In those patients, when they start to be very active and they start to anaphylax, we use short burst of steroids, 0.5 to 1 milligram per kilogram. It works like a charm. And when they are in the emergency room with a massive mast cell event, we can use that and we can just do a taper for 10 days, it works really well. And cytoreduction is something that we have been thinking about, but particularly uh, because uh, we have been thinking about tyrosine kinase inhibitors. And that's kind of where we are right now. You know, all the people in the world who think about this disease is, okay, for people who have advanced mastocytosis, uh, aggressive or associated with a hematological malignancy, we have cladribine, we have other things, and we have now new tyrosine kinase inhibitors. And Oh, I, I just before we go into in the details, I want to show you this also about sodium chromaline. So this paper is also one of my favorites. You see that I'm an old lady because my favorite papers are in the 70s. But there really uh, there's, there's not been another better paper than this one to show how effective sodium chromaline is. So this is a patient of Dr. Austin who was placed on disodium chromoglycate, and then he was serving as his own control. When placebo was used, his symptoms of the skin, flushing, itching, hiving, or CNS, you know, brain fog, or nausea, vomiting, diarrhea were flaring up. When put on disodium chromoglycate, everything went to zero, and this was repeated again and again and again. So sodium um, chromaline, gastrochrome, is a powerful medication that, although not absorbed, and we don't think that the absorption is more than 1%, and there's many pharmacological studies that show that, we think the metabolites of it are sufficient because they actually block the skin symptoms, the gastrointestinal symptoms, and the, and the central nervous system, which uh, symptoms. So, so this is a really powerful medication that we use uh, probably in 100% of our patients. And this is what I was talking to you about tyrosine kinase inhibitors. This paper just came a few months ago by, uh, and G. Macon was included there, and all the groups that uh, do mastocytosis were included pretty much, uh, on using midostorin in patients who have advanced. Uh, and so those patients were having, I think they're, have, you see here that their tryptases were in the 200, but they could be as high as 12,000. 12, so those patients really had an extremely high mast cell burden.
and they had aggressive mastocytosis here, mastocytosis associated with a hematological malignancy, mast cell leukemia, uh, or so, so those were really advanced mastocytosis. And the patients were treated, and they actually did well. So the, the, the life expectancy with somebody with mast cell leukemia is about six months. Right now, with uh, something like midostorin or uh, dasatinib or some of the tyrosine kinase inhibitors can be years. So I have a couple of patients that are going on three years with mast cell leukemia. This is unheard of. We never had that when I was a fellow. So, so this is a great advancement. So our thoughts are that if uh, midostorin can actually decrease the mast cell burden, it can also decrease the mast cell activation. So would it be possible to use something like a tyrosine kinase inhibitor, such as midostorin, or the, the new components, like there is a, a new uh, tyrosine kinase that's in the making uh, that uh, Blue Point, uh, a company, is, is actually making, would it be possible then to actually block the mast cell activation? And as, as said uh, at the beginning, uh, mast cell activation disorders are more about activation than about proliferation. So in indolent mastocytosis, we can have patients who progress every 10 years. Their, their, mass, their tryptase is like today is 10, and 15 years from now it would be 20, and then 15 years from now it would be 30 or 60. So it's not that their disease is of proliferation, but tremendous morbidity with activation. And we have not been able, you know, there's a, there's a need, we have not been able to completely block those episodes of mast cell activation with antihistamines, leukotriene blockers, sodium chromaline. So we're thinking that potentially uh, tyrosine kinase inhibitors could help our patients with indolent systemic mastocytosis. So there's two trials in Europe right now, in the Netherlands and in France, about metastoring being used for indolent systemic mastocytosis. Um, it will really depend on the side effects. I think those uh, tyrosine kinase inhibitors, the GI side effects are pretty prominent, so it's not easy to use them. But uh, I'm very hopeful that the dose adjustments will be done and we could, we could use them. So I think that um, I want to just, uh, I think I have a couple of more slides. This is the Mastocytosis Society, and uh, this is something that is very interesting. Uh, I helped uh, the publication of this in uh, the JSCI in practice in 2015. So this is kind of what in the main street you see. What is the reality? We are a mastocytosis center, so we actually get all the mastocytosis patients and potentially all the complicated mastocytosis patients. But what's, what's happening in the street? So what's happening is that a few years ago, the distribution was that cutaneous mastocytosis would be like one third, and then or and and then to, to the rest of it would be systemic mastocytosis. And now we have that cutaneous mastocytosis is about you know possibly not quite one third. We have like almost a, a half is the systemic mastocytosis, but mast cell activation disorders are now counting as another third potentially of that population. So what are those patients? I have no clue. This is like a survey. Uh, this is not based on a doctor's uh, diagnosis. This is not based on any data. So we don't know. They, uh, the patients claim they have mast cell activation. Is it a mast cell activation syndrome? Is it a monoclonal mast cell activation? But this population has grown dramatically and extensively in the last 10 years. And that's the population that we will need to know uh, what to do with, with those patients in, in our center. So I think that this is all I wanted to share with you. Uh, the center, uh, Jim Aiken and I uh, started the center. He's now in Michigan trying to build his, his own center. We have representation from hematology, pathology, dermatology, pediatrics, endocrine, gastroenterology. Uh, we are missing one of the key pieces of this, which is uh, the brain. We don't have neurology or psychiatry associated with us, and uh, we're working on that. We, um, we would like to have uh, some of the, uh, here at the Brigham, uh, int some interest in mass cell patients because they really need to be evaluated for the uh, brain syndromes. Uh, but otherwise, uh, I'm grateful for all those collaborations, and uh, we welcome any of your patients for one-time consideration. So you guys don't need to relinquish your muscle cytosis patients or muscle activation. You can just send them to us. We will provide a diagnosis of certainty, if certainty exists in medicine, but 99%. And then we will be able to bring the patient back to you with some recommendations and say this is what, what should be done. And the aim is to advance you know, patient care, research, education on mast cell disorders. Patients actually, when I started the business, Dr. Austin said to me that uh, he had like 40 patients with mast cell cytosis. He said, one of the things that I would like you to do is not only 
um, take care of those patients, but uh, advance the time between the initiation of the symptoms and the time where they have a diagnosis. And at, by that time, it was between 9 and 12 years. The patient that I diagnosed in the New England um, uh, that you, I, I showed you at the beginning took about nine years. So I haven't made a dent. I have not made a dent. We continue, I mean, the fellows, and I discussed that. We ask for triptases uh, when our patients go to emergency rooms, and we get back trypsins. So again, it, it, is, it is something that we have to take upon ourselves to think that this is an important disease, although extremely rare, but for which the patients suffer tremendously during many, many years. And by doing a triptase level or even a kidney mutation, we would be able to make a, a tremendous advance in that. So I uh, urge you to think, to have a level of alertness about those patients. They can present anyway, but the most common way they will present to you will be anaphylaxis or flushing events. And we are able to evaluate them. Matt um, Gianetti just joined us uh, at the Massachusetts Center, and I'm trying to recruit more people. So if young people think that this is a cool disease and want to come and join, I'll be more than happy. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you for sharing, for me, a lot of new and useful information. I thought it was terrific. So uh, we welcome your questions. Uh, we also, uh, those online are uh, also able to uh, submit questions. I uh, maybe get to start. I uh, was interested in uh, cutaneous involvement, uh, gut involvement with mast cells in patients with systemic mastocytosis. If you looked at nose, bronchi, conjunctiva, would you find it, or is that uh, is it the absence of mast cells in those organs, uh, organs that uh, is associated with the absence of asthma and other atopic uh, manifestations, and does that teach us anything about the disease? Yeah, that's a key question about, you know, that we have, uh, Dr. Austin, myself, and all the people who do mastocytes have been asking that question. So when you look uh, even at an op autopsy of somebody who died of indolent cystic mastocytosis, the places where the mast cells don't go, they don't go to the lungs, they don't go to the kidneys. And uh, the places where the mast cells go, do they go to the spleen, the liver, and the lymph nodes. So what is in there is stem cell factor. So, so we think that the homing of the mast cells really depends on how they, what do they express in the surface. They have KIT, and KIT is mutated, is constantly phosphorylated, is signaling, and that may actually make them to home to different places. But truly, truly, mast cells are not found in the uh, lungs of those patients. And I remember that my first autopsy, unfortunately, was uh, for somebody who have, had been um, uh, treating from Dr. Austin's uh, collection of patients for about 10 years. And, uh, and over the time, he had indolent, and he moved to a little bit more aggressive, and he ended up dying of aspergillosis. We gave him a lot of steroids. Uh, he ended up having a pulmonary aspergillosis, and he died. And uh, in the last two, three years that I have been taking uh, care of him, he had a lot of brain fog. So this was a very sharp guy who was the CEO of his company. He would come to my office, and well, almost, you know, I had to, to take his hand, and he was crying. And his wife is like, you know, and he could not concentrate. And it's like, oh my God, his uh, brain must be full of mast cells, you know, his meninges, because the meninges have a lot of vascularity. So I said, you know, they must be studied. So I went uh, and, and looked at his biopsy, uh, his autopsy. He had no mast cells in his brain, none whatsoever. And Dr. Um, Butterfield from the Mayo Clinic has actually looked at the lumbar punctures of some of those patients. There's no triptase there. So there's no, uh, brain, no mast cells in the brain, no mast cells in the lung, no mast cells in you know, all those organs. Um, organs that do have stem cell factor do have a lot of uh, invasion. Um, is that a, is there a sex difference? We, we certainly, as you're aware, we certainly see this in asthma where boys grow out of their asthma in puberty. Um, and you said that the, the kids who have mastocytosis grow out. Is there a sex difference in um, what happens? Is that's very interesting. So, so we have seen uh, that uh, at, around puberty, um, uh, boys lose it a little bit later. So for boys, it, it's around 12, 13. Girls, as soon as they have their first menstrual period, they lose it. Um, 
I don't have numbers to tell you, but uh, we have in the Maso Center been calculating that, and it seems that the girls lose it less than the boys. Oh. So testosterone, uh, and, and when, um, when Rick Stevens was here, he found a regulatory site for the key gene that actually testosterone could bind to that site. And I don't know if the site, and we didn't continue the studies, is also open to progesterone, estrogen in the same way. But it seems that the boys lose it more than the girls which is very, very interesting. The other thing is why, for example, in the muscle activation syndrome, it's just like a woman. And, and that, that part for me is more associated with activation of mast cells. It's not a proliferation problem, but still, uh, whether those mast cells express more of the receptors that uh, Frank Austin and, Laura, and Nora Barrett and Dan Dwyer have been described, it's possible. You know, the G-coupled proteins may be more in, mass, in, in females than males. Cited by our online questions, so let me share one. Uh, th this one um, uh, from uh, Aidan Long, our colleague, who asked, should all patients with mastocytosis be evaluated for venom allergy, even in the absence of a clinical history of venom allergy? Yeah, that, that's an interesting question. Um, uh, patients uh, who who have mastocytosis and do not have skin lesions uh, have a tendency to to have more uh, association with hymenoptera anaphylaxis. So those patients. Uh, we, we, we don't have consensus yet. This is one of the things that we are going to discuss in Paris in, uh, in October. But right now, uh, if the patient doesn't have a history, we, we have to look very carefully about having hymenoptera history in those patients. So we really hone in on, have you been outdoors? Have you ever been stung? What's happened? And if they have been stung, uh, we don't really do an evaluation. If there is a hint that the patient may have been stung, or that even if they have not had an anaphylactic event, they had, had some encounter that was uh, that had induced some symptoms we do an evaluation the other thing that's associated with that if if I am allowed to do that is that patients who have had an anaphylactic event with a hymenoptera may not have IgE so they may not be skin test positive or specific IgE and the question that we can get is do you give uh, hymenoptera a uh, immunotherapy to those patients, and we don't. We don't. It's not indicated. We don't know the epitope. We just don't do anything with that. We just give them Zolaire. So right now, we do give them Zolaire. They are 100% protected. I have several patients with that. So the mechanism is a non-IG mechanism. Do you give them Zolaire, and it's a non-IgE mechanism? Uh, so so they, they can actually die of a bee sting and they, they have been stung there. And, uh, you know, the off-target effect of uh, Zolaire protects them. What do you think the mechanism of the Zolaire effect is with mast cells? Excuse me? The, the mechanism of the Zolaire effect in mast cells is? You know, the, the mast cells in patients with mastocytosis are, is very, un, the membrane is very unstable because of the kid mutation. So removing uh, one of the receptors, you know, just by having the FC epsilon R1 binding to the, to the surface membrane, uh, phosphorylate, ERK, and some of the other, you know, uh, tyrosine kinases downstream. So removing that potentially stabilizes the membrane, but I'm really hand-waving here. I don't have any, any data. Yes, no. clinical history that's, you know, believable, and uh, nothing on, say, peripheral tissue biopsies. Do you think there might be a role for the hypogranular kind of mast cell, early mast cell progenitor that, Henny, uh, that Jenny Halgren recently described, similar to what um, Frank Austin and Mike Grosh found in mouse? I think that's a great question, and we haven't investigated that, but I think you're totally, absolutely right. In some of those patients, we do find that they have evidence of either prostaglandin or methylhistamine or some of the early mediators that could be uh, associated with that. When I did mast cell precursors in, in patients in uh, 90, 1995, I found that triptase is not kind of the major one that can, but chymase could be expressed, and then histamine can also be seen. So I totally agree that we should probably start looking for potential mast cell precursors in those patients. We are also um, following them linearly to see if that with time, those mast cell precursors may actually 
you know, end up being, you know, uh, early mastocytosis. And that's what we, we are trying to, to do. But trying to do like a flow cytometry, for example, in peripheral blood would be very, very important and very interesting in those patients. And I think that Dean Metcalf and, and Mallory Decore and the NIH, we, we are thinking about those lines to, to think about a study that would be able to detect those. Yeah, as you know, Jenny was able to do it in the peripheral blood of asthmatics just from circulating right. blood draw. So it seems, it, it seems to be intuitively that it might, might be the case. Yes. Thank you. Here's a practical question for you. If you're blocking mediators and you want to block prostaglandin, what dose of aspirin is effective? Thank you. So that's an important question. We have seen that uh, patients respond differently, and it's not really so much related to the level, but we try to measure the levels of prostaglandins, and uh, uh, we the maximum level of aspirin that we give is 650 twice a day, similar to what the uh, nasal polyps are. Uh, and you have a range between that, and you can actually lower the range depending on clinical symptoms, and, and we measure prostaglandins uh, you know, after we start this, so if they are suppressed, we kind of lower the dose. Yeah. Yeah, that's an interesting question. I, you know. Uh, so if there is a uh, relationship between muscle activation and, and metabolic syndrome, and the metabolic syndrome you're talking about, uh, patients with diabetes or insulin, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, we, we, we have, I mean, I heard about, you know, the potential for that, and there's a lot of uh, in the web uh, association. I think that there is no uh, data yet to support that those patients may have any of the mast cell mediators elevated in the metabolic syndrome. So there is like a, a clinical association with flushing, with some other symptoms of mast cell activation, but I have not seen any data to correlate that. But as, as Nora is saying, is it possible that early mast cell precursors could be involved in that? We haven't looked at that. It's, it's something in, of, of interest. Thank you very much for terrific questions and participation. Thank you.